Hey guys, we're back! Tabletop Tavern Tips has returned to the Wednesday slot. I must say, I have missed giving our D&D advice while running my little D&D podcast. But hey, we're back now. That's what matters. In any case, I'm about to do something I haven't done for a long while. It has been a good bit since we've looked at truly bad Dungeons & Dragons advice. And you know what? I think it's time because I stumbled on a whole book of bad D&D advice, though it's going to take me a little bit to get that video out. However, I need to satiate my appetite. So as always, I jumped on Reddit, found some bad advice, and some of it actually have some controversial feelings on it. So yeah, without further ado, guys, let's get started. All right, first up, you do not need to read the Dungeon Master's Guide, just watch this Matt Mercer playlist instead. So I know exactly what Matt Mercer playlist this guy is talking about, and I actually think that Matt Mercer's DM Advice series is very good. However, it is not a comprehensive catch-all on how to completely run Dungeons and Dragons because that series doesn't really exist. I don't think there's a single video series you can watch and now go, I know how to run D&D completely and fully, yay. But Matt Mercer's series is very good. I also recommend running the game by Matt Colville, which if there is a comprehensive how to run the game series, running the game is the closest you'll get to that. Matt Colville is a very talented writer and presenter and is very good at giving in-depth advice on how to build a world for your players to play in and how to run the game for them, even if he doesn't go into the nitty gritty of the rules. It's honestly a show you should watch no matter what game you are running. Now, the other hand of that advice is to read the DMG, and I'm gonna be honest, man, just like the Matt Mercer playlist, just like the Matt Colville show, I don't think reading the DMG is gonna confer you complete expertise on how to become a game master. I don't think any single thing can do that, because do you know how you learn to be a great game master? You learn to be a great game master by being a game master. Experience is what gives you expertise. You need to just go. There's not some preset checklist. Now, reading the DMG can be helpful, but if I'm being honest, man, I have not read the DMG front to back. I own the book, and it's honestly one of the books I use the least often. It's got good material in there. It does. I especially like a lot of the stuff about settings. It helps me a lot to focus on the things that are actually important for a D&D game. However, there's a lot of stuff that just isn't covered in the DMG, if anything, just because it's not some all-knowing font of knowledge. It's a book with a limited amount of pages and a limited amount of text room. It can't, physically can't, give you everything you need for a game, especially since every game is different. You want to get good at D&D, get a group of players together, and learn from there. Learn from the mistakes you make. Grow over time. That's how I got good at this. I didn't get good because I watched this video or read this book. It's because over time, over a lot of mistakes, I learned. Seven years later, and I think I'm a lot better at this now. I think reading the DMG and watching Matt Mercer's videos are in the same boat, honestly. They both are really good for helping you to be a great game master, but neither are a singularly perfect way to become great at the game, because the only way you could do that is by playing. Okay, next up, someone told me to run the campaign and show every role to the party. They spelled campaign wrong, that wasn't me. But in any case, I think that this is actually fine advice. Open rolling is something I've seen get more popular on D&D YouTube recently. There was a video that had like 100,000 views that talked about it as the way the DM played the game exclusively, and I think that's great. I do hide my roles in the players, though I just kind of do it out of habit these days. In the 10th tomb, I didn't fudge a single time, at least to my knowledge. While I might be misremembering, I don't remember ever fudging a single role, especially not major ones. I was completely honest on every role I made, and if I had shown all those roles to the players, I think I would have been just fine. However, there is this underlying anxiety in the back of my head when I DM that some insane combination of dice rolls will either TPK the party or ruin the narrative tension by making the combat too easy. And frankly, having this veil of secrecy gives me a level of security to change the dice rolls if I really, really need to. In fact, the DMG that we were just talking about advocates this as something you should do. And while I don't think you should fudge 
all the time, and I really don't think you should tell your players when you do it. Like, seriously, do not ever tell your players when you fudge your dice rolls. Ever, never, don't do it. But when you are DMing, having that veil, it's just something to lift my anxiety. Again, I didn't fudge a single time in 10th Tomb, but if I was open rolling everything, I would have been a lot more anxious about every single dice roll. And as a player, that's part of the thrill, but as a DM, that's adding a bit too much onto an already full plate. That's why I'm more comfortable with hiding my rolls. Not because I'm serially fudging my dice all the time, or because I want to be a greater person than the players and have this veil of secrecy that uplifts me above them, like some people imply. It's literally just to curb my anxiety, man. Okay, next up, the rules are just guidelines, a true statement that often leads people to a false conclusion that the rules are not important. Yeah, I think that the full version of this advice should be the rules are more like guidelines, but be very careful when you start changing those guidelines. Game design is freaking hard. A lot of people don't understand it. I just watched a full video about a guy complaining about Matt Colville's RPG which hasn't even released yet, my god, where he was claiming that the RPG is ruined and that Matt Coville has lost his mind because in this new and different game, Matt Coville doesn't have a role to hit. And yeah, if Matt Coville was just changing Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition and getting rid of role to hit entirely, I mean, yeah, that would be, that'd be pretty dumb, right? Because Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, the designers of the game built it around rolling to hit. And if you just remove this major aspect of the game, the game itself is going to completely change. But of course, Matt Coville, he's making a different game with completely different mechanics that's built around not having roll to hit. Duh. This type of fundamental misunderstanding of how the rules work or how the game is designed, it's common to have, and that's fine. Not everyone needs to understand why D&D or Pathfinder or Matt Coville's RPG, why these games are built the way they are. It is fine to not know everything about game design. That's not a crime. However, when you start making rule adjustments, you should do so with intent. You need to know why you do everything that you do, whether or not this rule adjustment is going to get you closer to your goal. For example, in my games, you accumulate points of exhaustion when you hit zero hit points and are knocked out. This is because I don't like death whack-a-mole. There should be a long-term effect, and therefore, that is why I instituted this rule. And guess what? It worked. My players tried to avoid hitting zero hit points like it's the freaking plague. And you know what? That is great. However, there are a lot of side effects, ripples that happen because of this change that I need to manage. For starters, it makes the game way harder, which again, I'm okay with. I like it when the game is way harder, but I did that with intent, right? The rules are more like guidelines is meant to prevent you from being so embraced in the rules that you can't change them even for the enjoyment of the players. Like for example, I read an RPG horror story where the DM was complaining that the module never gave the players items that they actually use, like never gave them hammers, for example, instead of swords. And my response to that was just change the swords to be hammers, the rules are more like guidelines. That is an easy, simple change that doesn't have major ripple effects that would make the game a lot more fun. The book is not going to shoot you in the face. That is why that quote is there. However, I do find a lot of new game masters get really embraced up in changing the game in major ways without understanding how to do so. And this is for a lot of games. A lot of people look at D&D when they think of stuff like this, but I've seen this in Call of Cthulhu and Vampire the Masquerade as well. Horror stories about people making rule changes that fundamentally altered the game in major, major ways without thinking of the consequences. And yeah, it's rough no matter what you're playing. Just be aware of what you're doing before you change those guidelines. Okay, don't be a rules lawyer. Sometimes it's good to be a rules lawyer because it's hard for one person to remember all the mechanics of the game. Don't be rude about it, of course, but it is good to have a good bit of knowledge of the game and to help the DM if they can't remember how a specific thing works and you do. I have generally found it very useful when I have a player who I can go to and say, hey, 
how does this work? Because, yeah, like this guy said, I forget stuff all the time. The DM is under a lot of pressure basically the entire game. Say for player to player roleplay, I have to be thinking a lot. And sometimes I don't remember every rule. And having a person I can go to to say, hey, how does this work, is really great. And frankly, that person, the paladin in my campaign, doesn't always know. Sometimes you gotta look it up, but luckily, he's got fast fingers, and therefore, we can figure out the ruling quickly and cleanly without needing to worry about spending tons of time arguing over it. Remember, the rules lawyer is meant to solve conflict, not create it. That's the main difference between a good rules lawyer and a bad one. A bad rules lawyer is somebody who wants to start fights, arguments, wants to prove themselves right, and wants to disrupt the game. Okay, maybe they don't want to disrupt the game, but they care more about proving themselves right than they care about not disrupting the game. That's the problem. A good rules lawyer is someone who solves conflict, who says, hey, this is how that works, and that's it. A good rules lawyer isn't out here to start a war. A good rules lawyer is here to solve a conflict. All right, next up, bring it up on r slash dnd and see what they think. Okay, look, I don't know anything about r slash dnd. I'm on there to see art and that's about it. But let me tell you, I do think it's a good idea to have some kind of discord or subreddit that you're a part of where you can ask questions. Like, I sometimes have small questions about my DMing. Like, hey, how will this scene land? Or, hey, how do I play this kind of NPC? And having a Discord where I can just like copy paste that is great. Like I'm a part of a few YouTuber Discords, a few DM advice Discords, and like, I'm not taking their word as gospel. Some people have said some really truly horrendously dumb things on those Discords, but I mean, more often than not, I get some good advice. Like, for example, in the 10th tomb, there was an NPC who briefly appeared, and I wanted her to make a big impact. She's a mad scientist lady who should really creep out the players, and I needed some inspo, and I just didn't have anyone in mind off the top of my head. So I went to a bunch of my discords, copy and pasted a question, and I got a lot of good inspiration for that character. Because she only was in one scene, I needed her to make a strong impression, and while I don't know what alternate universe Crispy would have done without all that advice, I'm happy with this Crispy and what I did with that character in the brief time I had. Even if not specifically from r slash dnd, I think it's good to find somewhere where you can ask questions. Next up, Mike Merles. Characters should level every session. Okay, Mike Merles, I don't really know why you said that, but that's, uh, I mean, that's certainly some kind of advice. I don't know in what context Mike Merles said that. If you're unaware, he's a game designer on Dungeons & Dragons. And, I mean, that's not great advice for most games, I will say. I actually did level my characters almost every session because in my first campaign, I needed to wrap up everything very quickly at a certain deadline of like five weeks. And I want my players to be level 18 by the end of that, and they were level 13. So, therefore, leveling up every session. And I don't think it ruined the campaign by any means, but I do think it's good to spend like some time in the levels where you're at. If you keep on leveling up too fast, first it decreases the import of the level up. Like during that spree of leveling up every session, my players weren't really excited every time they leveled up. But on the other hand of that, I do think in general, it is hard to pace level ups, especially if you don't have like a perfect map of how the campaign is going to go. We as DMs are not clairvoyant. We don't have a timeline that precisely tells us when our campaign is going to end and the optimal strategy on how to make our player characters level up. A lot of us use milestones so we can level up at our own pace as dungeon masters, but I do think that that at times creates some hesitancy around leveling up, especially since I as DM like challenging my players, and my players exceed their levels faster than I can build encounters, then that's a problem. I like keeping my players around the level 10 range. It's my favorite place to be. I can have really challenging combats, while at the same time not having to be insane with all the mechanical difficulty I put my players through to compensate for their inane levels of power. Pacing your level ups is a skill, but Mike Merles is leveling up every single session thing. While it didn't break my game, it's probably not a great idea for yours. It's just gonna create a lot of 
it'll create apathy towards leveling up, and it might cause your players to not know anything about their abilities. Just like a one-two punch to them having fun. Next up, I heard DM say that warlocks are boring because once you've seen one, you've kind of seen them all, which is just such a bold thing to say, but arguably the most customizable class in 5th edition. Warlocks are my favorite class. How dare this man say that? And dude, I honestly think all the classes in D&D have a fair amount of flexibility when it comes to making a cool character with them. I've seen cool characters of every single class. And if you say once you've seen one, you've seen them all, to any class in D&D 5th edition or in most TTRPGs, I think you've got a little bit too much of a closed mind. I didn't really have any interest in Paladin because I had this idea. You know, Paladins are these righteous knights and I don't want to play that. But I came up with an idea for an Oath of Conquest Paladin bound to vengeance against those who hurt her. She has a more witchy aesthetic and I really, really love it. She's based more on Eris Morn and less on Uther the Lightbringer. And I really want to play this character. She is a lot of fun. And yeah, I don't know if that's the most creative idea, but it's certainly different from the normal paladin aesthetic. Ginny D recently made a video about artificers. She had a very close-minded view of what artificers could be in a D&D game. And she admitted that she was wrong. Artificers can be more than steampunk adventures. You can create all types of different artificers. Like, uh, for example, in Crown of Deceit, I had an artificer who was more like a building contractor than a steampunk inventor, and I thought that that was really, really sick and really, really cool. Look, don't be pigeon-held by the stereotypes of your classes. Don't ignore those stereotypes, all right? Righteous Knight Paladins are freaking awesome. But if you're not interested in playing something like that, like me, then don't be afraid to change it up. Let those creative juices flow, okay? Every class can have a diverse aesthetic if you got the creativity for it. Okay, finally, you have to give the DM what they want because if they don't play, there is no game. I couldn't count the number of times I've heard this. Yeah, let's just encourage DMs to hold the game hostage. That's sure to work out for everyone. I will say this is a knee-jerk piece of advice that probably reacts to how some players treat DMs. Like there was a push on D&D YouTube a while back for DMs to become referees and for players to just take over the game. Like it was literally a push for players to move the DM aside. That was the rallying cry for this small, but in my opinion, noticeable quote unquote movement of players. And frankly, that really annoyed me. Like, I thought that was dumb. Your DM is supposed to be part of the group. You're not supposed to go out of your way to push them out of the way. They're not your enemy. They're here to facilitate your enjoyment, but also their enjoyment. Now, I will say, I don't think a DM should hold the game hostage, but there is a social contract. Like, when you join a D&D game, like Curse of Strahd, for example, you can't refuse to go to Barovia because of player agency. That's dumb. You're here to play Curse of Strahd, you need to go to Barovia. <laughs> if you go into the game with the express purpose of disruption, you just want to disrupt the DM's campaign, you don't want to participate, you just want to screw around, I'm sorry, I think you're a bad player. I don't think you're a good fit in my game. I'm going to get rid of you. <laughs> That's not me holding the game hostage, that's just me making sure that I have a good time as well as the other people who actually want to play the game with me. I don't think it's bad advice for DMs to know what they want in their campaign, but I do think a DM needs to clarify that before the game starts. Like, set proper expectations. The social contract needs to be presented to the players, otherwise they don't know about it. Especially new people. Like, new players don't really know what's going on in the game, so a DM does need to tell them like, hey, this is what I want out of the game, what do you want out of the game yourself? And give them advice on what to do when they actually start playing. But new player, experienced player, it doesn't matter. You do need to keep in mind what your DM is trying to do at the campaign. But on the other hand, don't let that hold you hostage. I don't want my desires to DM to stifle my player's creativity. Like for example, one of the coolest things in the 10th tomb happened completely against my expectations. That was great. But it was a balance. That player was still operating within the framework of the game. She wasn't trying to be disruptive. She was doing something that fed into the overall theme of the campaign. And while it was surprising, it did make total sense for the plot. And she didn't let it derail everything. It was a detour that was fun and interesting. It's almost like there's a balance and it's not a black and white seesaw. I think a lot of people have trouble comprehending stuff like that. 
But seriously, it's a balance between player agency and a DM's campaign. You do need both. You need a DM who's not being constantly purposefully subverted, but you don't want players with stifled creativity. Make sure to openly communicate about your expectations as a DM, and as players, make sure to openly communicate about what you want to do during the campaign, the kind of freedoms that you expect. Overall, that whole ramble, don't let your DM hold the game hostage. Yeah, that's good advice. But at the same time, don't be a dick and try to subvert everything your DM does just for the sake of player agency. Because player agency isn't fun if it's meant to hurt your DM or worse, the entire party. If you guys enjoyed, you're probably going to enjoy our latest episode of RPG Horror Stories. For some reason, the algorithm really shot this one in the foot. Like, I have no idea why, but like, not a lot of people saw it on their YouTube feed. So it's linked in the cards if you missed it. But before you go, please do like this video and subscribe to Crispy's Tavern as soon as any of our content comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own tips or thoughts, go to the comments down below. If you can't think of comments, leave the comment. It's not a seesaw. So let me know if you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.